All right, we're getting started. Good evening, everyone. You know that we start punctual because there's always too much to talk about, even tonight. And for those of you that are here thinking we're gonna talk about very cute things, you're in for a rude awakening. <laughs> I mean, there's gonna be some cuteness, but not that much. So good evening, this is Paola Antonelli. I'm a, a longtime curator here at the Museum of Modern Art and director of R&D. And these R&D salons are ways to help citizens and to help ourselves think of important matters in life by coming together here at the museum and discussing with scientists, with politicians, and especially with artists and curators, and to try and at least put some pointers in our lives about matters that are uh, important for everyone. And tonight we're gonna talk about dogs. Dogs not simply as dogs, but as stand-ins for others, as stand-ins for companions that are part of our lives, but that we have not pondered in depth for a while as to their position in our lives. And I'm starting with this great picture by Jamel Shabazz. I don't know if Jamel is here. He was supposed to come tonight and it would have been great because we could honor him in person. But this picture by this great New York photographer, uh, he said, taught, use, in this picture he used everything that his father had taught him about photography. And we can also say that this picture contains everything that we're going to discuss about dogs tonight. What's going on in this picture? Are they playing or are they fighting? Who's the boss? And what about the cliche of a black man and a pit bull? Uh, what is everybody else doing staring on? You know, really, what is going on? And we can find out by speaking with Jamel that they were playing, that actually what the dog has in its mouth is a piece of leather, that it was all in good jest. But still, there's a threat in this picture and there's a sense of suspense that gets us thinking even deeper about really the position of humans and dogs and humans and animals in the world. It is really important to think about it in this day and age. I mean, last night we, are, uh, we, we were uh, given a, quite a speech about veganism by the winner of the Oscars for Best Actor, you know, and it was quite amazing to listen to Joaquin Phoenix, but also, even though that's an extreme, we have been discussing a lot what it means to deal with others. And dogs have been stand-ins and animals in general for others for a very long time. We cannot have a salon here without quoting our goddess Donna Haraway. So here we go with this wonderful quote that uh, asks, how might an ethics and politics committed to the flourishing of significant otherness, and how beautiful is that significant otherness, be learned from taking dog-human relationships seriously? And how might stories about dog-human worlds finally convince brain-damaged U.S. Americans and maybe other less historically challenged people that history matters in nature cultures? You know, just a little dose of reality <laughs> next to this beautiful painting from Ethiopia, anonymous from Ethiopia, pretty recent, that shows this beautiful balance and harmony of all the animals together, uh, culture and erudite reading the scriptures, as opposed to instead a netherworld of wildness, of wilderness, and of savagery. So this double feature, this double side of animals, has remained in our culture. But when it comes to dogs, there's also the issue of domestication, the issue of companionship, friendship, and also supremacy and domination. Dogs have been part of, of people's lives for the, a very, very long time as domesticated animals. You can find all of these different wonderful descriptions. Look at that, the Chow Chow, an all-purpose dog of ancient China, presents the picture of a muscular, deep-chested aristocrat with an air of inscrutable timelessness. This is the American Kennel Club. I mean, wine, wine writers are much more retained and contained as opposed, you know. So you can find dogs in ancient Egypt, in, uh, uh, in the ancient Latin American civilizations, pretty much everywhere, even the Lagotto Romagnolo that is a truffle hunter. So for a very, very long time, ever since we can remember, we've been living with dogs and domesticating them. And at this point, we are in a veritable industry. There's a market and an industry that is about having dogs in your life. You can uh, ponder these slides later on when they will be published. We're not gonna go into too much detail tonight, but truly it's a 
sizable industry that has a, really a weight on the uh, balance and a weight also on the <clears throat> In the life of many Americans, especially New Yorkers, it's uh, very expensive to have dogs in New York, it seems, and uh, I've never had one, but so they tell me. Um, well, it's also really disturbing to find out that in order to live with us, dogs have changed their features. Not only have we breed, have we bred dogs and have interbred dogs, but also we have led them to abandon certain traits, for instance, the, uh, or to ad adopt certain traits, for instance, the ability to actually uh, lift a particular muscle of their eyebrow in order to actually communicate or be with us. And the adaptation has continued, the mimicry and the exchange has continued in the centuries to an extent that not only do we design dogs, but also do we convince them to become anthropomorphic. And it's a, a trait that we find very comfortable because in order to anthropomorphize uh, animals, we can be more comfortable also thinking that we can communicate with them. And we'll hear more from expert Alexandra Horowitz about whether that's possible or not. Of course, dogs are also political symbols. And uh, for the first time in our White House, we have a president without dogs. Actually, apparently, Ivana Trump said once that he was not a dog person. She was the one with the poodle, but he never really liked dogs. And uh, at this time, there's no dog in the White House. But even though we think that this is not really ideology, but just comfort, there is sometimes ideology. President Zuma of South Africa thinks that having dogs is a white people's uh, endeavor and that it is kind of unacceptable that uh, people are more careful about their dogs than about other people. So there is also, this is something that we've heard also from other philosophers and ethicists, but it's fascinating to see that the symbolism of dogs in politics can go either way, even though in the Western world it's mostly going in our usual direction. Cop attacking dogs, dogs and protests. Well, politicization of dogs goes either way. And there have been dogs that have become really companions to protesters. In Chile, for instance, Negro Matapacos that died in 2017 and is now immortalized in all sorts of imagery. Or for instance, Lukanikos, which means sausage in Greek, that was uh, uh, alongside the rioters in 2011, not rioters, protesters in 2011 because of the economical situation. And Spitak, or Whitey, the Armenian protest dog from 2016. So it's funny to see that there's also this kind of companionship, but also there's another side, a dark side, the weaponization of dogs. It can be a benign one. You'll see that on the left-hand side, apparently Vanity Fair in, in 1933 donated a dog to the Museum of Modern Art after the Brooklyn Museum got robbed of certain valuable paintings so that we would have a guardian dog after hours roaming around MoMA. But in more serious situations, we've seen dogs weaponized by police and uh, by the military. The famous pictures uh, of uh, Abu Ghraib are unforgettable, and in some cases also used for rescue of wounded citizens uh, under ruins. And of course, dogs can also, especially German shepherds and that particular breed, are also used sometimes in, uh, um, in, in imagery that is not particularly positive. For instance, you see here here at the bottom, the symbol for the Turkish Grey Wolves neo-fascist party. But also we have Conan, the destroyer, the dog that took down our Baghdadi, and that's probably the last uh, military dog that has been part of our lives in the past few months. One could say, you know, and that's what we'll discuss tonight, if we really want dogs or animals to be our pets, by the way, is pet a demeaning word. We should think about it that way too. If we really need pets in our lives, how about having robotic pets? What's the ethics of robots as animals in our lives and also as weaponized animals? As you can see, Boston Dynamics robots that were tested by the Massachusetts police are not at all of the benign kind. Wait, I have a laser beam so you can see them here. 
Natalie Jeremijenko in 2007 also uh, deployed these feral robotic dogs to sniff pollu pollutants in the air and in the ground. And in other cases, we know about the products and commodifications, for instance, with the Ibo dog by Sony from 1999, or with Paro, that is this like little um, seal, little robotic seal that is meant to keep company to elderly people in retirement homes in Japan and elsewhere. There's also um, the idea of giving rights to, uh, to animals. And you know, there's been a lot of discussions about animals since they're part of our lives, especially dogs, being considered citizens. But what would be even more important would be to give them rights as workers, perhaps. There should be unions for dogs. And actually, in certain parts of the world, uh, service dogs retire, are up for retirement when they reach the age of 10 or 11. So truly, maybe citizenship is too far for us to be able to come template, but workers' rights, at the very least, could be part of that idea. And you see here a few examples of working dogs, from the shepherd dogs that we are all familiar with to, you know, of course, service dogs, but then also therapy dogs for, for survivors, for instance, you know, in Uganda. And th in this work by Revital Cohen, that is a speculative designer, it's the idea of uh, uh, greyhound dogs that retire after races becoming almost life support, almost outsourced respiratory systems for patients with respiratory diseases. Of of course, this is a provocative view of how the symbiosis between men, humans, and their uh, closest companion could be perceived. Artists have done a lot to uh, talk about the plight and the uh, destiny of dogs and animals. First amongst them, Joseph Beuys, of course, whose political party for animals poster is one of the most interesting envisionings of how animals could be part of our political system. And artists also have tried to envision how to have true empathy and true understanding of what dogs go through. Joseph Beuys, once again, his famous performance, I Like America and America Likes Me, in which he spent three days with a coyote amongst other um, accoutrements in a gallery. And the coyote and the artist would learn to live together with suspicion, not with any comfort, but still to coexist in that tight environment. On the bottom right is Thomas, Thomas Thwaites, who took a holiday from being a human being and transformed himself into a goat and lived with goats for four days and was accepted by the herd of goats. Or the great naturalist Charles Foster, who almost got killed trying to make himself into a deer hounded by hound dogs in the woods and uh, in the woods in England. And he went through the same experience with otters and with many other animals to try and really understand what it means to be them. Many different performances and many different uh, artworks have, uh, uh, have employed or at least centered around animals in order to understand. And tonight we will talk with the very different, uh, the very different people that own that hold very different opinions about dogs. And it's going to be quite a great conversation. We're going to, I'm going to go in no particular order, alphabetical, no particular, almost. We're going to have Benedict Boisron. I'm not going to go into the whole bio because you have it already in your invitation. But Benedict is an expert in Afro-American and African studies and has written a great book called Afrodog. Jack Halberstam is professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies and English at Columbia University. Then we're going to have Alexandra Horowitz, who's a professor at Barnard College, where she teaches seminars in can canine cognition. And then Will Rawls, choreographer, performance artist, curator, and writer, and part of the MoMA family, definitely, <laughs> you know. And Henrik Veldelin, who's an entrepreneur uh, and the, uh, an author and the co-founder of Bark, that's a company where there's a beautiful building on Canal Street that's more dogs than humans, and I really love it because I'm an, in the neighbor. And last but not least, Yang Wu, who's a real estate developer of a very special kind. And I'm not going to say anything more because he's going to uh, be the one to tell you. I'm going to start, also you know there's going to be different interspersed videos as usual, and then at the end we'll all talk and really have it out. I'm going to start with a video and then call to the podium Alexandra Horowitz. So the video please. <coughs>
The question is, how has domestication affected the natural order? Now, the way that question is phrased implies that the domestication of plants and animals is not natural, and that such a thing as the natural order even existed, but that domestication has undermined it. And it's true that giant rabbits and miniature pigs don't seem very natural. But underneath this question is the assumption of our species as smart, goal-directed thinking people who deliberately initiated the domestication process in order to bring about complex societies and space travels and labradoodles. My contention is that this assumption is flawed and thus the question itself is invalid. The initial steps in the domestication process were not deliberately initiated so much as they emerged from the interaction between people and the plants and animals around them. The resulting changes to both our constitutions and those of domestic versions of our favorite plants and animals took place as a consequence of intensifying relationships. Domestication is thus an emergent evolutionary consequence of interactions between species. As a result, it does not affect or subvert the natural order. Domestication is the natural order. Right. Alexandra, get this. <laughs> Alexandra Horowitz. Thank you, Paola and Moma, for this invitation and opportunity to speak to all of you. I'm a dog cognition and behavior researcher. Um, so in this context, I find myself representing science, um, which is a little bit formidable. But I also write about the culture of dogdom, and so I want to talk to you today about the tension between um, how our science considers dogs and how maybe we consider dogs living with dogs and uh, aspects of the culture around us via V dogs. In science, we start with first principles, and I would say in this case, for, for us, we have to resolve this question. I'll pretend that this can be answered, um, but maybe it cannot. To begin, I will say that to us in cognitive science, Dogs are a gregarious social animal who share a common ancestor with the gray wolf. They are, as Gregor was saying, domesticated. Domesticated comes from a root meaning belonging to the house. So they are, in that respect, animals who belong around our houses. Um, domestication, I would say, is a variation of natural selection, not preempting it, but adding to the selector, the human. They've been bred by us for maybe 40,000 years, and I agree, probably we were not intentionally domesticating, but wolves probably started self-domesticating, and then at some point we took over. And it's only the last 150 years, starting in Victorian England, that we started pure breeding dogs and resulted in the elaborate diversity of dogs we have today. Um, they are also human companions. They are ever more therapy dogs, as Paolo was saying, and they are detective dogs. This is a dog at Penn Vet Working Dog Center searching for missing persons in um, collapsed buildings. They also are detection dogs searching from everything for dairy cows in estrus to bed bugs to um, orcas, which they can detect through smelling their poop. They are family members to 95% of us who live with dogs. Um, and it's not unusual, this is at Hartsdale in our north of New York, to um, not only bury the dog, but uh, have a plaque representing their life. Of course, to many dogs, they are small furry people, thereby subjected to various indignities. At minimum, we can conclude that they are, therefore, thereby behaviorally flexible enough to put up with us. So given this history and their roles, uh, my field, dog cognition, is, in, is invested in determining who they are cognitively. And especially we're interested in, are they human-like in their cognition and how they think? In many ways, research has found that they are. For instance, they see our gestures, such as a point or a gaze, as informative, as communication in the way very few non-human animals do, so they can determine which plate might be baited with food by watching us. They see our attention, and so in some ways see into our minds. In this case, this study has um, a dog um, told not to eat a treat in the middle of the room, and then a person sits and watches. And the dog basically avoids the treat, but when they close their eyes, the dog goes right to it. <laughs> and turn your back, and they do not hesitate. 
dogs can learn to mimic our behavior, even if it means mapping their body with their paws to our hands. And they're sensitive to social situations, and they won't work for no reward when they see someone else is getting rewarded for no work. Though they're not language users themselves, they can learn our language if we use it assiduously and carefully with them as Chaser, you might know Chaser, is right in the middle here, died recently, a border collie. She's here surrounded by some of the 1,022 no uh, toys that she knew the name of. So many toys and so many names that her owner had to write the name on each of the toys because he couldn't remember. Again, the, the Gerard Gethings, the trope that people look like their dog is actually borne out by research. Um, strangers can match pictures of owners to their dogs um, as Gerard then asks people to try to do the reverse. And this is the result. My colleagues focus on who the dog is um, relative to humans, but I think that misses that the fact that they live in a world which is separate from us in many ways, a world of smell. The dog is a creature of the nose, and that's where my work lies. So we've found things like, for instance, that they can distinguish quantities of a substance by smell alone that they can recognize the smell of themselves and notice when their own smell has changed, even it, when it is in a canister removed from them, that they recognize their person, their owner's smell, even distant from their owner. And in fact, I posit that they, in some ways, are telling time through smell. They're able to track you through noticing the difference in odor concentration in the first step you take out the door to the fifth step you take out the door. The fifth step has more of your smell in it. Implicit in all of this work is the idea that the dog is an agent, a person, if you will, who puzzles, attends, learns, and smells. Still, many might correct my question that started this to not who, but what is the dog? And in fact, our legal system does so to the law today the dog is equivalent to a chair. They are both owned property. To say that you own your chair is to say that you have absolute rights to do with your chair what you want. You can sit on it. You can throw it out. You can put it in the basement for 20 years and never touch it. You can reupholster it. The law says that what you can do with a dog is more or less the same, even though they are thinking, feeling, smelling creatures who are family members. The result of this status for this attentive language use understanding dog is that, for instance, judges refuse to determine custody in divorce cases. They are instead distributable property when people are split. Typical, a typical opinion um, by judges saying that asking for custody of the dog is like asking for custody of the family butter knives. Their material add-ons go for a flight, you can check your keys, you can check your, sorry, your skis or your Labradoodle. You can take your pet on Amtrak as long as you pay 25 bucks and they are odorless and require no attention, like no dog I've ever met. <laughs> and they can be used, and they are used in medical research. This is Pavlov's dog, and they still are used. About 65,000 dogs are used in medical experiments in the US currently. They can be used to pay our debt, their collateral. Okay. This is a dog named Edda, who this year was sold um, on eBay for $850 after being collected to pay her person's debts. We can make more of them, and in fact, we've normalized breeding dogs for profit, or in a new and unwelcome twist on this, we can clone dogs, as Barbara Streisand found out, using a farmed industry of dog egg donors and dog surrogates. And finally, we can alter them in a few ways. We alter them per breed standard. This Doberman is born this way, but the breed standard says that their ears should be cropped and raised and their tails should be shortened, and so they are. We've altered them genetically and constitutionally by purebred dog breeding, making pugs, for instance, into short-nosed dogs who resemble primates more than dogs or wolves. This is some other dogs who have been altered over the last 150 years. This poor um, German Shepherd is a champion and barely can hold up his back legs. This is the Afghans, 
over the last 150 years. And the bulldog, who used to have a face and whose nose is now smushed, his head is so big that they must be delivered by cesarean, um, and who needs surgery in order to be able to breathe properly. Finally, we can kill them. Um, half a century ago, it wasn't uncommon for people to put their dogs to sleep instead of boarding them when they went on vacation. And this last year, um, this case represented what we can still do. You can put in your will that when you die, you would like your dog to be killed so they can be buried with you. So what studying dogs has left me with is this question. Who are we? And who would we be as a species if we reconsidered how we dealt with dogs? Thank you. That was great. These years, I make artworks in collaboration with living things, such as hermit crabs, bugworms, parakeets, octopus, and so on. Here is a work called I Wear the Dog's Hair, and the dog wears my hair. I wanted to change this hierarchy between humans and dogs. I tried to give a part of my body and get a part of my dog's body. His name is Chero. When Chero wore the coat from my hair, he looked so excited. He might have noticed the smell of himself coming from my cape. To tell the truth, I got an allergic reaction to dogs because I sucked a lot of dog's hair. This experience gave me one lesson that we cannot readily adapt some parts of other animals' physical bodies. <laughs> so now, Henrik Berdelin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the latest research shows that most are allergic to male dogs, not female dogs, and so you might tell your artist friends that her next dog could be a female dog, and she might not have that problem. Um, about uh, eight years ago, uh, my co-founders and I um, started to design um, toys for dogs. And over the last eight years, we have now produced uh, over 100 million dogs and sent that to uh, millions of, of dogs here in the US. And so uh, this talk is about how we look at designing uh, toys that makes dogs and their people happy. Um, and a core principle is something we called symbiosis design, and that is really where we try to take clues from, um, from the world of kids and their families. And I see a bag from Lego, we are very inspired by uh, the likes of Lego, how to design something that uh, is good for both. Um, it all starts from obviously a personal story. This is my dog Molly. Um, she is my uh, love of my life. Um, she is, um, um, she, we rescued her when she was about two from the streets of Mobile, Alabama, and I think as many families, it was uh, my wife's idea first, but now it's very much daddy's dog. Um, and so um, a lot of time uh, when we started to do this design, you know, I, I thought that I might just be that only crazy dog parent out there. Um, it turns out I, I'm not the only one. Uh, we've done uh, quite a bit of research on the subject, and it turns out that most of the people who own a dog considering their best friend, um, we say we love them quite a lot, often more than we do to our spouses and, and partners. Um, we sleep with them in our beds, and a lot of us do it in a way that's uncomfortable for us because we want to make sure that our dogs um, are happy. Um, so this symbiosis, uh, how we think about it internally is as togetherness. How do we build more moments of togetherness. And um, I brought a few examples of kind of like how we try to design for them. Um, one thing we do is we design both for the dog and its person. Um, I brought a few examples of our uh, toys that sometimes have surprises because then the owner of the, of the toy gets surprised too. Uh, this is Consuelo on the left side. Uh, she's happy on the outside and sad on the inside. And uh, people on Reddit have not yet found out why. 
Um, we don't know either, uh, but we just thought it was hilarious. But what we do is that we try to come up with toys that have a narrative, and often that have a narrative for the owner, because what we find is that when the owner gets very excited about a specific toy, um, so does the dog. And so all our toys are kind of designed for this kind of like doubled purpose. Um, the question then becomes, how do we make sure that we design something that the dogs also like? Um, and uh, we're reminded of that. Uh, this is a picture from my, uh, from my seat in the office where we have a dog pile. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a 1,000 or 24 or whatever uh, the other dog can remember, but there's a lot of toys there. And what we notice is that the dogs from our office will come in, and they won't just go over and pick any random piece of toy. They will pick that specific toy they want to play with that day. Um, and so they will, uh, I think this is a rider that's kind of jumping in and trying to figure out which specific toy um, to play with that specific day. And so what we wanted to do was to try to figure out if we could take that design experience and put that into a retail store. And so we tried to design the first store ever made where dogs would do their shopping. And I, I brought a little bit of a video and I'll explain that. Human shopping isn't a good fit for dogs. So Bark & Co. built the first store where dogs shop for themselves. We call it Bark Shop Live. The technology behind Bark Shop Live helps you learn what your dog likes, dislikes, and loves. When we opened the doors, we weren't sure what would happen, but we were pretty sure it would be awesome. So uh, I'm not gonna play the whole video, but what we did was we built RFID tags into the toys and then an RFID receiver on the dog itself. And we created a mobile app so owners of dogs could come into our store, they could have a cup of coffee and the dogs could play around with the toys themselves and their mobile phone will then tell them what toys the dogs like the most. Um, interesting, we found that a lot of owners then went over and bought the toy that they liked the best instead of the dogs. And so um, that's one of the things that we may discuss later. Um, and so we continue to try to develop these experiences. And other things that we've done is to try to figure out how to design physical space. Like one of the interesting things of your mission is to make dogs and their people happy is that how can you do that? And the reality is that while we can take our kids to playgrounds and different things, there's not a lot of places where we can take our dogs. Uh, you know, we can't take them to the cinema and we can't really take them to a stand-up comedy show. And so we wanted to try to build those experiences. And uh, this is an example of um, a dog park that we built. Uh, we built a few membership dog parks where um, they're really uh, places uh, where uh, people could go hang, but um, they're really curated kind of like uh, experiences where people can do different things that they can't normally do with a dog. I have a little video of it also, and I can talk a little more to it. We wanted to create a place where we could really extend the time dogs and their people could hang out together. We have these back pots where they can sit and work. We have a cafe with good coffee. We have Wi-Fi, restrooms, staff to make it safe. The staff are great. They all know Jameson and all the other dogs by name, and uh, we love coming here. Jameson loves the space. He loves the toys from here, and the treats are like filet mignon to him, so. The events are so creative. The hands down, the events are one of my favorite parts. We've done uh, stand-up comedy nights. We've done movie nights where you can come and watch a movie with your dog. We'll have beer tasting. We've tried all these different things. Very memorable moments here at the Bark Park. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> I am definitely one of those uh, crazy dog people that uh, you might say that this is the bike that we've designed so I can get around with my dog in an easier way. Um, but that concludes my presentation. Thank you. I'm Lori Gruen, I'm an animal ethicist, and I've been asked to reflect on what would be the ethical guidelines we might use to operate when we're living with other dogs. And for me, one of the really important things to keep in mind is that there are captives. As much as we love them, we are in control of what they eat, when they go out. Um, and part of, I think, what we need to do in order to be in a good ethical relations with dogs is to allow them to express themselves when they are um, when they're out and about when they're in our homes 
when they're sort of engaging um, in the world. Um, and so one of the things that I think is important to do is to sort of allow each dog to express their own unique personalities. And you just saw Zinni. Zin uh, likes to dig holes. And um, I don't like having holes in my backyard, but it's something that is meaningful to her. Uh, of course, I'm not going to let her dig up the whole backyard. That's not fair to me. But we compromise. She has a space where she can dig holes. Um, similar kinds of um, concerns would happen with smaller dogs who maybe bark more. Uh, we don't want to encourage that kind of incessant barking, but we do need to allow them to express themselves. We control them, and it's important for them to be able to have some self-expression. And that's going to vary. Uh, so it's important for us also to recognize the distinct needs of each individual dog that we might uh, have as a member of our families. Young Wu? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, yeah, you? Yes. Hi, this is the story of my dog, Comandante. To me, dog is like human, but scientist says they have 85, 84% of human DNA. I believe they took the best part of human DNA. They left behind the bad 16%. And for that reason, they know how to give unconditional love. And this the 16% DNA they have that creates awesome look. <laughs> and he was a superman. And he had endless energy that inspired us. And he traveled all over the United States. He was very adventurous. And he was a leader of the pack with his sisters and adopted dogs. But he died. He was five years old, not long ago. A few days before he died, he was watching the sunset, and somebody was sad. And I believe he knew his end day was coming. Five days of difficult time, three different uh, beds and three different wrong diagnoses. He died because of a human error. And he endured unbelievable pain, but he was wagging his tail until last minute. And we miss him a lot. What I learned during that difficult time, there are many good beds, but some reason, our best was all corrupted and full of greed of money. I wish that can be changed. So as Alexandra said, the law says dogs are a property. It's like furniture. It's only worth it so much as you paid. And because of that, many vets goes away from any mistake they make. And that has to be changed. And that gave us a inspiration to build a happy place for dog and us. So we're trying to build this project called Condominium 184, 100% human, 84% dog, a place we can coexist and we can learn each other together. And we give unconditional love to each other. So this is a project in Chelsea. We are uh, contemplating to make it happen. And this is the floor plan. That is the lobby for the uh, dogs to come in. And they're going to have their own space. They can relax. They can meditate. They can play. They can eat. And once owner choose their unit, they can select their sofa, their bedroom, I mean their bed, and their fixtures, and even they can select bathtub that dog likes. And we're gonna have a dog park where they're gonna interact and they're gonna meet new friends. 
and we're gonna have a dog spa to spoil them and we can massage them and we can take them to bed and we can even give marijuana pills and we're gonna create a special app on every unit that almost anything that dog likes we can provide including they can choose any dog chef food and they they will deliver to you. And we're gonna have a dining room within the complex in special location. You can dine with your dogs. And there are many more uh, we're trying to implement and we are studying, we are working. Uh, we actually work with Barks about understanding how dogs and humans can interact. And I hope this project will inspire uh, many other developers and politicians and community leaders to allocate 10% of their unit specially made for the dogs. Thank you. research in a multiracial Durham, North Carolina neighborhood, I found that dogs are not necessarily the social connectors that people expect. In fact, dogs united white residents in positive ways, but often led to negative interactions between white residents and their black and Latinx neighbors. While white interviewees said that they went to dinner and even on vacation with other white residents they met while walking their dogs, black and Latinx residents did not describe similar experiences. This is because white residents use dogs as the basis for negotiating neighborhood boundaries, their feelings of safety, and racial and ethnic differences. For example, Black and Latinx dog owners were watched and policed by white residents, in one instance with actual binoculars from someone's backyard. The dog routes that white residents used also generally avoided the predominantly Black and Latinx areas of the neighborhood. My findings help illustrate how racial inequality and white dominance can manifest in unexpected aspects of social life, including our pets. Hello, my name is Cade Crawford. Uh, I work at the ACLU in Boston on technology and civil rights issues. I'm here with my friend Pepita. Uh, Pepita is a civil rights advocate as well. I am really troubled by the idea that human beings are making robots that will... The police use a robot that actually was designed to defuse bombs, to deliver a weapon to kill someone. Um, so I'm very, very troubled by the idea that we would anthrop anthropomorphize, or I guess not anthropomorphize, but dogapromorphize <laughs> uh, robotics that can potentially be very harmful to human beings by making them look like our very sweet, furry friends, the pooch. <laughs> Will Rawls. Uh, next up in the <laughs> Westminster Lecture Show. Um, thank you, Paula, for having me here. Um, I'm not a dog expert. Um, uh, Oh, I have to control this. I'm also not a PowerPoint expert. <laughs> um, but I'm here because in 2014, for the online magazine Triple Canopy, I published an article that chronicles a series of performances I created uh, over the course of three years, centered around um, three years, centered around the freestanding painting of a German shepherd dog that I had made. Uh, I devised several solo dances exploring movement in relation to and often in contact with this dog painting. This is not it. After each show, I took the dog home and lived with it. I moved it around my apartment, lay next to it, put it in the garden, introduced it to visitors, all the while meditating on the temptation to attribute canine or some species of consciousness to it. In truth, the German Shepherd painting was providing a crucial and sometimes embarrassing mirror for a self-centered artistic process. Uh, whether paintings or not, I concluded maybe dogs are only images of ourselves and not of themselves. As a choreographer, I ask, where does a dog come, where does a dance come from? Uh, which dancing for which body in which space? 
what images or histories must be animated or displaced by this dance? So while I researched German shepherds, these questions led me on a parallel track to reevaluate the virtues of dance technique and my decades of devotion to it. Much like the German shepherd, dance raises the question of how rigorous training can become a tool for enacting violence to human bodies, uh, often while impressing audiences with feats of spectacular exertion. Uh, I'm not ag against exertion. Uh, however, dance, rather than being approached through the vehicle of technique, uh, can be approached instead as a form of behavior exerted over time a form less driven by virtuosity of shape and more by virtuosity of instinct, timing, context, and even accident. Behaving my ideas began to support a range of choreographic experiments since it lent itself well to both improvisation and pattern making. And in the best case is a mix of both. I took my dog drama even further by asking how might my dancing exert force against the symbolism of German shepherds? How might we both be released from the historical force of our training? Most accounts of the origins of the German shepherd credit Max von Stefanitz, a nobleman from Dresden, with founding the breed in 1889. Some believe that the German shepherd resulted from mixing two breeds from the north and south of Germany, symbolically integrating the country's many fractious political and cultural groups. In time immemorial, Stepanitz wrote, the warlike proud German held in high esteem his courageous hunting comrade who helped him in his struggle with the rampaging wild ox, the destructive boar, and the greedy beast of prey. Stepanitz pushed for the breed to be employed by the military and police. Utility is the true criterion of beauty, he asserted. Eighteen years later, in 1907, the first American police dog program was launched in New York City with mixed results. But German shepherds are descended from projects of national consolidation and white supremacy, even if today's uh, Smart Owner's Guide to German Shepherd Dogs exclaims that GSDs will love your kids. Celebrated by canine aficionados as a specialized work dog, the German Shepherd carries a fraught history as a tool for lethal state suppression during the Civil Rights era. In 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, Bill Hudson forever captured the dubiously iconic leap of a German Shepherd caught in midair while burying its teeth into the chest of a black protester. I decided to leave this image out of my slides in part because this genre of image needs little introduction, but it was not Paula's introduction. Uh, the familiar entangled figures of the protester, police officer, and dog are reproduced often, rendered in the truthy gray scale of that print news era. Aside from the figurative and newsy information in the photo, the image also depicts a dual abstraction, a black person transformed into a routinized abstract target of violence, and a dog transformed into a weaponized abstract power of the state, both bound together in abstract historical stasis. I wanted to remake and undo and possibly liberate to some degree this dog image, but it meant doing the same for an image of myself as a black figure in relation to this dog image, and for the image of myself as a dancer. It meant claiming some aspect of our historical and photogenetic bond, claiming some agency as a human, and attempting to disturb these truths by literally setting them in motion. I choreographed exchanges, scenarios, and a series of diverging narratives between the dog and myself. I built a sonography, a kind of obsessive dog environment overloaded with images of dogs, which I will share in a video in a bit. I explored dogness as an approach to performance choices and movement qualities. Um, I created structures for accidents, skill sets, and mess. I never mimicked the dog, but I explored the affective impulses between my bodily senses and the dog image as a kind of mimetic communication. Uh, as Anna Gibbs writes, mimicry is not a representation of the other, but a rendering, a relation between things in which, like a flash, similarity appears. On January 21st, 2009, the day after Barack Obama's inauguration, I had a show scheduled at Dixon Place, which is a theater on the Lower East Side. A few months prior in his victory speech following his election, Obama promised his daughters that he would adopt a dog for the White House. Uh, the puppy moment as the press dubbed the incident, spawned a nationwide puppy watch. The public's fascination with the presidential dog also seemed to be rooted in questions of pedigree. The puppy watch may have temporarily diverted the national obsession with Obama's lineage, Obama, um, ob embodied by the birther movement, uh, but it symbolically mapped Obama's qualifications onto the vetting of the presidential dog. During Obama's first post-election press conference, a reporter from the Chicago Sun-Times asked about his plans for the first pet. 
quote, this is a major issue, Obama replied. I think it's generated more interest on our website than just about anything. Our preference would be to get a shelter dog, but obviously a lot of shelter dogs are mutts like me. Although I may be the only Democrat left who hasn't run for president, I identified with Obama's presidential scale conundrum of pedigree and racial vetting. Uh, what would it mean if the Obamas had adopted a German shepherd instead of a Portuguese water dog? And so I painted one. Here. Um, the premise of the first dog performance was I'm dog sitting for the Obamas while they attend their own inauguration. Uh, the final dog performance entitled Frontispieces culminated with a dog, with a dance involving eight dogs that I constructed, some painted realistically, some abstractly. This next clip starts with me carrying one of the realistic dogs on my back. The sound score is an edited recording of my studio as I built and painted the dogs. <laughs> Thank you. So the wording of the question suggests that animalization and racialization are two entirely distinct possibilities. So the wording of the question suggests that animalization and racialization are two entirely distinct processes. I want to suggest instead that we think of them as profoundly and inextricably linked, so that race is a species concept and species is a race concept. Non-white groups, and this applies with particular force to blacks, have been abjected through comparisons with animals. The paradigmatic case is the idea of the predatory Negro brute, which was invoked as a justification for lynching in the US for at least a century after the close of the Civil War. The flow of meanings can also move in the other direction, which is to say animals can become racialized or invested with racial meanings. A good example here would be the pit bull, which became more popular in certain black communities in the 1980s, and as a result has been blackened or racialized as savage and dangerous by nature which has something to do with why pit bulls are the most frequently euthanized dog in U.S. shelters today. All of which invites us to think more deeply about whether racial liberation and animal liberation are at odds, as is sometimes suggested, or whether they are in fact complementary projects, which may even require one another. Benedict Boisson. Thank you for having me here. Um, I will start with a little story. So I published this book in 2018, and I was invited recently to the University of Washington in Seattle. And a student came to me, and the book was assigned for her class, and a student came to me and she said, you know, uh, I just read your book, but my roommate uh, was really mad when she saw your book, the cover of your book, on my nightstand. And she said, if ever a professor would assign that book to me, I would just um, boycott the class and be really mad. And I thought it was because it was an offensive picture because of the black man being attacked by a dog. And I found out that it was because um, the undergraduate student was uh, an animal rights advocate and she didn't like how the dog was being portrayed 
on that picture. And this is just to uh, give you a background to understand why I started writing this book, because um, in the history of uh, animal rights advocacy, there is a lot of comparison between racialization and animalization. And using uh, the slave or slavery, the history of slavery and blacks to justify better rights for animal rights. And I wanted to understand uh, what is this relationship, uh, particularly in America, in the Americas, between the black cause and the animal cause? And when is it justified to combine both together and when it is not? And um, one of the recent examples, but there are many of them, if you start looking around, you see that there are many examples of this association between the black cause and the animal cause. And this is one from two weeks ago from the Super Bowl when PETA uh, launched um, an anti-speciesism uh, ad using Colin Kaepernick and to say, yeah, we talk about anti-black racism, but what about anti-speciesism? And uh, PETA was just piggybacking on the black cause one more time. And as you said yesterday, um, at the Oscars, you had uh, River Phoenix talking about, not River, jo Joachim Phoenix, thank you. Um, talking about uh, the fact that at the Oscars we talked a lot about gender and race discrimination. And in that case, he wanted to show the intersectionality of all forms of oppression. And he said, and what about species as well? It was done in a very different way. So uh, it's an open question. And this is what my book was trying to do, raise the question, not necessarily answer all the questions, but when is it valid and when is it not justifiable to, to use that comparison. But first, to explain the context of my book, I have to go back to my own history. So this is my parents' uh, wedding picture. My, my mom comes from France, and my dad comes from the French Caribbean island of Guadeloupe. And they met in France, and they got married, and they had three children, and I'm one of them. I think the hair is not that different on that picture. And uh, I was always raised with German shepherds. And um, it was a very important part of my life. This is also why I'm so interested in dogs, and particularly German shepherds. And um, I was raised uh, near Paris, and but after, when I was 20, 24, my parents moved to Guadeloupe. And so I would go and visit very often. And I was very surprised. They moved with their German shepherd. And I was very surprised to see the difference of the, the way people in France reacted to dogs as pets, and the way that in Guadeloupe they reacted with fear and threat and they wouldn't enter the house when they saw the German Shepherd. And I asked my dad why. And my dad explained, oh, it's only because of history. You know, you have to understand that in the islands, um, we used um, bloodhounds and dogs to track and uh, run after runaway slaves. So there is this atavistic fear of German Shepherds when you are born in the, within the history of slavery, when it's past slavery. And um, so that's, that opened my eyes. And that's when I started reading about it. And, Eventually, after many, many years, I, I wrote that book to understand the history of blacks and dogs in particular. Um, and one of the books that I read was uh, a book from Martinique, exactly about that. This is a lyrical poem about um, a slave, an old slave, who doesn't need to run away because his life is behind him, but this is just a challenge. He decides to run away because he knows that the uh, dog owner and the master will launch the dog after him. And the whole book is about uh, this chase uh, between the two. And at the end, they fuse together through their race, through the speed of the, of the chase. They come together as one. Um, but you have to know that the history be um, of colonialism and slavery didn't start with uh, black slaves, but it started with Native Americans. During the time of Spanish colonization of the Americas, um, the Spanish conquistadors already used uh, dogs to chase after um, and to devour, in some cases, Native Americans. And if you ever get to read a short account of the destruction of the Indies uh, by Bartolome de las Casas, you will see very vivid uh, descriptions of Native Americans being devoured with their babies from dogs. And this is from Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's a very interesting story because in Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, you don't see, uh, there is no scene of, uh, of dogs um, chasing and devouring a runaway slave. It's only mentioned in the book. Um, you have Eliza, the runaway slave, who runs away with her baby, and she crosses the frozen river. And as she crosses the frozen river, you have slave merchants who are trying to catch her. And they think, what about just launching a dog after her? And then they realize, no, it's not a good idea, because it will damage the goods. 
uh, the value will be very different, so, so let's not do it. But what is interesting is that all the stage productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin that were very popular in the 1880s, 1880s they all included uh, a mass of dogs, a pack of dogs, um, uh, as a prop, because they knew that would attract the audience. And we go back to what Will and you did as well, the famous picture of, uh, um, in Alabama of a German shepherd attacking a dog. And what I want to say is that it's exactly like Uncle Tom's Cabin. The idea of a dog, particularly a German shepherd, attacking a black man is something that has been iconized in this country. It becomes even popular culture. And by becoming popularized, it also becomes part of our collective consciousness. And it's a picture that we see and that we fantasize about unconsciously. So much so that um, Paul Youngquist was one who said that dogs are biological weapons deployed against an enemy whose animal ferocity justifies a response in kind. What he's trying to say is that um, both blacks in America and dogs are seen as having this propensity to becoming very ferocious. And this is why they are used against each other. Blacks and dogs both are supposed to be submissive, and yet they are not really submissive. They have this propensity to fight back, which brings us to an interesting uh, semantic analogy between a movie from uh, the 1980s about Cujo, who was uh, a dog bit by, um, by a bat that had rabies and became uh, crazy and started attacking people. And this uh, submissive pet became a ferocious animal against human beings. And the Cujo of the movie reminds us of Cujo, who was a maroon, which means a leader of the slave rebellion in Jamaica. And he was very ferocious as well and killing a lot of whites. So you have always this idea that both blacks and dogs have to be very submissive, but in them there is this nature that wants to rebel and attack. So you have to control both. And this is another, another book about uh, Chien Blanc. It's a French book that became an American uh, movie as well. And Chien Blanc is a southern dog who is trained to attack blacks. And in the book, um, a black man tries to retrain the dog to attack whites instead. So always the idea that um, you have to fear both because, and th this explains why, because you have so many repetitive images of dogs and, and Native Americans as well with, um, with blacks that this is a recurrent image also in the news. This is what I wanted to say. I'm gonna go fast because I don't have much time left, but even when you have um, blacks protesting like in Baltimore and dogs are not used against them, then you will have a politician saying, why are they not used against them? Because you're so used to seeing that repetitively that you actually crave for that image. This is why he made, he had this Twitter about saying, yeah, they, they, they can run like fast food. And the last thing I want to say is that Josephine Baker was one who had very big dogs when she was living in Paris, and her French adopted son wanted to know why are so many blacks in the 1920s in Paris owning big dogs? And Josephine Baker explained to him, his name was Jean-Claude, oh, it's because during slavery they were used to uh, attack slaves. Uh, and so now we want big dogs on our side, and this is why we own big dogs. Um, all I want to say is that I don't know if it's because they want dogs on their side. I think it's just because blacks, like any other human beings, are allowed to have dogs and we don't have to justify that. So seeing that, knowing the history, took me many years to understand the history because I was raised in a context where I'm not aware of really much of the analogy between the racialization and animalization. I want to know what impact it will have for our legacy. And this is Pierre. He, uh, he's my son. And you can see Armand ahead of him, my other son as well. And like me, just like me, they are mixed, French, yeah. German, American, and <laughs> they have been uh, they are being raised with German shepherds as well. And I want to know how they're going to carry on that legacy. Thank you. dogs is that we'd like to imagine our relationship to them as mutual. After all, they're meant to be our companion species, the offsprings of our brother, the wolf. Uh, but in reality, this is really a commercial relationship. Dogs are design products, they are mass produced to fulfill all sorts of forms and functions. Um, in 2008, I made a work that suggested using retired greyhounds as mechanical ventilators. Um, th in this scenario, 
dogs, greyhounds too old for racing, would be retrained to become some kind of life support machines. Therefore, establishing a relationship which is a lot more parasitic in nature and in which the exploitation as well as reliance go sort of both ways. Um, I wanted to rethink about organ failure from a moment in which we automatically become cyborgs and connect our bodies to computers to an opportunity of reconsidering post-humanism as, as a chance to become some kind of an interspecies organism in which true mutualism can exist. Unfortunately, our society today is premised on the idea that humans are above and exceptional to all other beings. So there is a stark binary that informs our social orders, our legal orders, um, our economic orders. But um, this is a social construction that we can challenge, that some cultures today do challenge, and that even within Western traditions um, uh, have been challenged in the past, and a different type of cosmology or worldview about how a human should relate to animals um, has prevailed. We need to get to a space where we see humans as on a continuum with other beings, as not superior to, and we think of our families, our neighborhoods, our cities, our nations, our whole um, global sphere, the earth, as a multi-species community in which humans play a very small part. Unfortunately, the part that elite humans have played in the last several centuries has created vast amount of change for so many of the world's inhabitants, human and especially non-human. So in order to kind of arrest as much as possible now uh, climate disruption, to intervene in the injustices and misery of so many uh, non-elite beings on this world, including non-human actors, and to think of our own happiness and well-being as being um, dependent on harmonious relationships with other species, we need to understand that the human-animal binary is um, something that is amenable to change. Jack Halberstam. <clears throat> All right, uh, so I'm the last speaker, so maybe it's good that I give a slightly polemical uh, take on animals. I'm gonna suggest that the animals you live with, that you love, that you think love you, are actually plotting uh, <laughs> silently and secretly uh, to overthrow you. Um, we've heard uh, about the connection um, between racism and uh, the analogies we make between people of color and pets, but I want to add to this discourse about animality a take on uh, queer relationships uh, to uh, animals. Uh, the very first video we saw suggested that there was a natural order, and a natural order already presumes uh, some kind of descent from God to human, to animal, but it also assumes a kind of heterosexuality that takes the form of a family that has children and that has dogs. You might therefore be interested to know that until about the 19th century, sodomy laws were directed both at people who took some same sex partners, but also people who took as their sexual partners animals. And so this idea that the natural order depends upon getting the level of intimacy that you have with your animal just right is predicated upon a kind of homophobic uh, understanding of sexuality. So I'm willing to you know, propose and guess that many people who have animals think that kissing the animal, uh, hugging the animal, sleeping with the animal, cuddling the animal, are all completely reasonable things to do. But very few people are going to consent to the idea that having sex with the animal is wrong. So let me just say that this is a deeply normative understanding of sex and uh, intimacy. It might, in fact, be the case that the dog is, finds it way more alien 
to kiss than to fuck, okay? Just saying, dogs don't do a lot of kissing. That's why we call it doggy style. They're not facing each other. Um, and so, you know, this is part of a deeply felt cultural narrative that we have about the human, in which the human loves the dog, rescues the dog, is kind to the dog. Uh, and part of this narrative absolutely depends upon the idea that the human does not have sex with the dog. So I, I want to suggest that, in fact, the, the pet uh, is not a, a companion animal. This is very much contra Donna Haraway but is a zombie extension of the human, confirming what a good person uh, the human is, as opposed to actually having its own logic of existence. And now I'll just sort of uh, spin through the slides, and uh, here we go. Uh, we'll start a narrative about how to get pets out of our houses, uh, uh, liberate them from our intimate sphere, um, and think about what liberation might me mean for animals. So John Berger uh, reminds us that, quote, the practice of keeping animals regardless of their usefulness, uh, the keeping exactly of pets uh, is, uh, blah, 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 is a modern innovation. And on a social scale on which it exists today is unique. It is part of that universal but personal withdrawal into the private small family unit. Decorated or furnished with mementos from the outside world, which is such a distinguishing feature of consumer societies. Emphasis on the consumer. The pet is part of a nuclear family-oriented, consumer-oriented society. It's a way of sort of personalizing and privatizing our relationship to the animal to pull it into the house rather than keeping it on the outside as it used to be in the context of the circus or the zoo. And Berger suggests that ending the circus or ending the zoo is not necessarily liberation. It merely passes the stewardship of the child to the home. So we just we let the animals go from these large enclosures and we place them inside the home. Uh, there are lots of really great cartoons about animal liberation I just have to recommend to you. Uh, Chicken Run is amazing. Uh, mostly because it's uh, all it's all chicken, so it's it's actually feminist. Uh, just a little bonus thrown in there. Um, there is a sort of useless old rooster that uh, hops around, but uh, what's more, they're Marxist uh, chickens. I like to call them uh, organic Gramscian organic intellectuals uh, because they theorize from the ground up their own liberation. Once they realize that they're about to become commodities in the farmer's industry, uh, they uh, set themselves free. Now, what's great about this film is that their freedom could have come from the natural activity of flying. But as one chicken says, chickens don't fly, so they actually build a plane. Um, so they refuse the idea of any natural liberation that is associated with the bird. I know it's a human narrative, but just bear with it. All right. Animal resistance has actually been a bit of a topic in animal studies. I mean, a lot of animal studies, as you've seen from uh, some of the commentaries in between, are about caring for the animal and letting the animal go its own way. But there's another strand of animal studies that wants to see things that we have depicted as simply atypical animal behavior as actual animal rebellion and resistance. So just as an example, we often talk about rogue elephants. Uh, in one book, we hear about a rogue elephant who very, very carefully picks its way through a crowd of children and people who are leaving the circus, finds his trainer, and then beats him to death. And the point being that the elephant knows who he's looking for, looks for his abuser, and then picks him out of a crowd. Uh, so Jason Hirable makes the argument that we rationalize away animal behavior, when in fact we should be seeing in animal behavior very clear signs of resistance to human control. Just to give you two examples of uh, very different uh, pet films that are interested in exactly this theme by way of conclusion, so that was like real animals that rebel, um, here's one of the narratives that we tell ourselves, and we'll go through uh, two of these. One is The Secret Life of Pets, I hope some people have seen it. Snowball, of course, comes from uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. And the idea is that 
the pets are incarcerated in human homes and they escape one, at one point when the humans are away, they escape and they form an underground group of resistant uh, animals. And you have a, actually uh, midway through the film, we have an amazing speech that Snowball gives telling the animals to rise up against their owners. Unfortunately, it is like a Hollywood cartoon. So we find out that the pets are just dismayed that their animals have, their owners have given them away. And as soon as the owners take them back, all the rebellion dissipates. So that's super disappointing. But luckily, we won't even watch that. We'll end with um, uh, White God, which is a take on the book that we just heard about uh, uh, and the film, uh, White Dog. So White Dog was about the white racist dog. White God, on the other hand, is a Hungarian film uh, about a young girl whose uh, dog is kicked out of the family home by the father. And it's significant that the family is depicted as a broken home and therefore the dog doesn't belong in it somehow. So it's part of this sort of normative national order. The dog is kicked out, picked up by a uh, guy who wants to train it to do dog fights. It rebels against the trainer and then goes back to an animal shelter where it joins forces with many other dogs and um, the dogs rise up against human society and go on a very savage rampage, killing and eating people who were, in fact, just previously their so-called uh, owners. I'll just show you a quick clip. Okay, and um, so this is a film actually I, I can't show you a clip of because it cannot be released in the US because it's about a young girl who uh, uh, dress, finds herself, makes herself a suit so that she can have sex with the wolf dog that she's adopted. And this is considered too obscene uh, to be shown uh, in the US. So just three points to end with then. Uh, the fantasy of redemption that we use as an alibi, that we rescue dogs, is part of this zombie narrative. You cannot rescue what you, yourself, as a human society, have first endangered. Uh, dogs are only out on the streets and abandoned because of this particular structure that we've created. Um, animals are not part of a natural order within which we are the masters and they are the creatures that we let into our home. We need to actually contest the whole idea of a natural order and animals should not and maybe we should be questioning the way in which they've become part of an industry that sees them simply as a commodity either to house or to feed or to nurture in some way uh, and it's part of a much bigger capitalist framing of pet ownership that sees entire uh, parts of the city like parks turned over into dog runs while we round up homeless people we turn more and more of the city into places that dogs can easily play um, I would argue that our values are in the wrong place and ultimately what I want to say is that uh, what the, there's a kind of lesson in the films that I've talked about about animal anarchy that asks the question what if we are not the authors of revolution, but the masters that must be overthrown? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Please come.
Could I please invite all of the speakers to join me here on the dice? Please, take seats. This has been quite a crescendo, or at least a modulation, of different viewpoints about dogs and about what it means to live with animals. And um, it usually, we usually do not have polar opposite uh, opinions that we can find. I mean, it's hard to find completely uh, dissonant and uh, polar oppositions. But so how can we possibly uh, live with dogs at this point and at the same time create the kind of justice that Jack is talking about? Is there a way to move backwards? Is there a way to move forward and to, how do you envision, for instance, Hendrik and Young, how do you envision our life with dogs in the future? More of the same or do you see an evolution in which the relationship between master or owner and pet changes somehow? Mm. I'll start with you, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank uh, you, you're welcome. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Um, and I think the first part is probably to have these type of discussions, which you know I haven't been exposed to before. And, and so, first of all, kind of like really salute the fact that we have the salon. Um, I think the way that I think about it, and and maybe it's because that at the time where we adopted our dog was the same time as we had our first child, is less of a kind of like a master relationship and more that of a child. Um, mm -hmm. And so. Um, I think today raises a lot of like interesting kind of like thoughts, which you know will take me a little bit of time to compute. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's um, very honest. I appreciate that very much. Mm -mm. It would be it would be crazy if you told me, oh yeah, I have the answer. <laughs> I'm 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 just uh, I'm just thinking about it deeply. And Jack, but I, I think want there to, is yeah. there is like what I was thinking is that how you can you, you can hear some of these arguments and find a lot of them to make sense, and how you could also you know, think that your own behavior is also okay. And so I think having two kind of counter arguments in your brain might be okay, right? You know, it might not be that these things are kind of like completely out of points, um, but that, that there are kind of like arguments about like how would you, you know, I was taking to the point, I think you made that too, that dogs don't like to be hugged at all. Um, mm -hmm. I think you've been written about that. And I think, you know, obviously it's like a much more funny provocative point of saying, you know, like they, you know, they don't like kissing as much as like having sex with them, uh, or, or they do. And so I, you know, I think that's a, a good point. And I think some of those things, you know, like it's not stuff that we so necessarily should belittle. Like if we find that dogs do not like to be hugged or kissed, you know, we should be thoughtful about that. Because mm -hmm. I do see that at least the relationship that I have with Molly is that of a symbiotic relationship and a mutualism symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, like as you learn some of those things, like you, you reflect on them. Jack, w how would you see the ideal relationship with animals and with dogs, for instance, to be? How would I? S how should it be? How should it be? No, I'm. I'm. I'm not. I, mean, I don't think I'm here to say what it should be. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in saying, look at the uh, narratives that are hidden in the the cozy, sentimental narratives that we want to tell ab about dogs. Oh, we just want them to be happy. We want them to choose their own toys. We want them to dig their own holes. We want them to live in their own apartments. It's a kind of, it's a cover really for a fantasy of human benevolence, um, as, which is really stark, particularly at a moment when in fact, uh, real estate capitalism is one of the main forces, you know, driving cities today and creating massive amounts of homelessness. It, it seems to me that we, we have to think about what it is that we're, what do we want from the animal that has nothing to do with your particular relationship with your particular pet. Mm -hmm. It's to do with a different, a whole structure in which we have fantasies about how good we are and the, the pet is really central to some of those. So it's just the idea like we, we got our dog when we had our child. I mean, that kind of equivalence is uh, making an equivalence that, that I think is a problem. The dog is not a child, and the dog isn't necessarily even like a child. Even Donna Haraway says, you know, uh, we should not be making that comparison. The dog is another species, and to the extent that it just gets folded into narratives about the human, uh, it is only ever a zombie. 
I liked what Manisha was saying about the continuum of species. So there's like a, um, a sequence and not an equality. Well, I was, I was really stunned when you talked about, I don't remember the name of the creator of the German Shepherd, but the fact that he, he equated beauty with utility, that's like old school design. So the idea of designing dogs, it seemed like that was really a product of design. Did you convey that in your choreography, this real design, so means and goals towards an end? Um, no, I think I tried to do, if there is an opposite, the opposite, in that mm -hmm. I was, I wanted to complicate what, um, what dance can do in relationship to the idea of the dog. And so I designed all these dogs, I put them on these kind of sliders, so I had to study the weight and how they fell and could they slide and stacking them and building shapes. Um, and then created a kind of, you know, let's say like an obstacle course for myself in which to explore these kinds of complications um, and problem solving in real time, um, but not in order to emerge with a kind of like um, clear presentation of how well designed the dog is or how that good design then speaks of a kind of symbiotic relationship between me and the dog or my choreography and my own body even, but that, you know, I wanted to run interference because it started from this idea of the kind of civil rights image, right, and this kind of, this sort of the dog that's been designed historically, you know, um, to suppress peoples, you know, across oceans, but here in the United States, black people primarily, and that I wanted to loosen this up. And the way, it wasn't, in, it wasn't to kind of take that history and kind of give a lesson, but actually to try and achieve something larger, which was like a kind of more broad destabilization. Mm -hmm. um, through a kind of obsessional thinking. I mean, there's dog, there's like the negative space cutouts of the dogs that I set up around the stage, but I just, I wanted to create more problems and raise more questions and kind of apprehending the truth and apprehending my body mm -hmm. or the dogs. Gotcha. And uh, Young, Comandante seemed to be amazing and also pretty lively and loving of open spaces and adventure. Do you think he is, it's a he or she? He. he. Do you think he would have been happy in the, um, in the building that you're planning? It seems to me like, like Comandante would have gone crazy in there. Well, I wish that we can create uh, to fit every dog's desire. Uh, but to me, you know, it's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, dog requires their own space and 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 if we can create a happy place where master and dog can interact more uh, you know we've been taking commandante in our new york uh, home and you know up there of course he has more freedom to go up but he never went to wild area then he never came back home you know he enjoyed human relationship I think, you know, we as a human, giving is a wonderful thing. I believe that dog behaves uh, based on surrounding and how they treat it. If I go to South America and some of the area, dog is very difficult to deal with. But in the United States, you don't see that many. And mm -hmm. I hope that we can contribute to get closer mm -hmm. and interacting each other and can learn. So in other words, they're New York dogs. They don't wait for the green light. They want a massage and a spa and some meditation in order to. <laughs> I think it's take time for the dog to learn all that. <laughs> <laughs> so Benedict, um, we talked about shepherds a lot, German shepherds and other kind of shepherds a lot tonight. And it's beautiful, your life story and uh, what it, you know, you're growing up with shepherds and uh, then your, your research about them. And it also really struck me because I have a, a Lebanese friend who hates dogs because she's afraid of them, especially German shepherds. And uh, um, dogs have been used on many uh, oppressed populations, the Jews and during the Nazi era. So it's quite interesting to see what you were saying about Josephine Baker and about also your experience having the big dogs with us. So it's at the same time um, wanting to exercise a past and also to have protection and a sense of um, so interesting. So what do you think is going to happen with your son and his dog? Is it going to continue? 
I think that... Um, Does he still have that in him? What is very interesting with him, and the same way it was for me, is that I was raised in France, that's biracial, as I said, and we don't have already that concept of blackness in the French context. It's very different than America. So um, moving to America, I had to figure out my blackness. At the same time as I had to figure out the history of blackness in the American context and the Americas in general in the Caribbean, at the same time as I discovered the importance of the dog and the complexity of it um, and the way that I may be perceived in that country, uh, in this country, by being black, but also owning a German Shepherd and owning a watchdog or a fierce, fierce, or fierce bulldog. And I feel it's the same with my, my son, because um, what does it mean to be black when you look like him? So he's going to have to first figure out what blackness means in, within a French context, because his mother is French, but also in America, where he's going to be defined maybe as such. And after that, he will slowly, like his own mother, try to understand what it means, this complexity, uh, with the dog and the watchdog. So, so he's going to have a, a similar journey or a very different journey. I don't want to see that. Yeah, indeed. Alexandra, you're in the trenches. All of these different discussions about should we, shouldn't we, should we own, should we be owned, you know. And so how do you, how do you navigate that? And what are the disputes you found yourself in that you were perplexed by and that gave you pause? Well, my interest is, is almost always just the dogs. You know, I want to, I'm just fascinated by them. And so I always come back to, you know, what is it like to be a dog? And so in America, I am interested in what are the customs that we bring with us? Um, what are the attitudes we bring about dogs? How are we making new dogs? How would we treat our dogs? That's just of interest to me. And then what is, what to sort of, what would the dog do? do without us is of interest to me too. And so some of those things are very contentious as is coming up here. Um, ownership of dogs, I think, is a peculiar idea, um, but, but not also the idea of liberating dogs somehow. I, I do believe they're kind of captive to us, you know, having, having changed them to be constitutionally unable really to survive right now without us, we're in this pickle where we kind of or maybe have the wrong way of dealing with them now, but we can't just kind of let them go. Um, so that's a very big issue. And then kind of all the ways that we control them and control their behavior, I find problematic. And of course, I live with dogs, and they are cap right now they're home, captive, in the apartment, right? Um, I find that interesting, and people are troubled by that fact, that we are controlling their lives in that way, and I don't know how to solve that, particularly if I left the door open, I don't think it turns out to be better for the dogs. Um, but for everything about all the choices that the dog can't make, because um, we make them for them, I think that's really fascinating, um, including a really interesting choice, which converges a little bit with, with what Jack was saying, which is their reproductive choices, right? So our dogs are, in America, most of our dogs are, are sexless dogs, essentially. There's no breed standard that says, this is a really sexy dog, right? We don't want our dogs to be sexy at all, and I find that fascinating. And we spay, neuter, to spay or neuter your dog is the responsible thing to do, and that's fascinating to me. So all those things are contentious. And because I started from just an interest in understanding the perceptual and cognitive world of this other species, it almost comes as a surprise to find that I'm living in a culture where that isn't the priority, but instead all these kind of traditions that have grown up and maybe haven't been rethought about um, who dogs are. Um, another quick question for you, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. But um, is there a cultural? Are there, is there a difference between amongst cultures in how you treat dogs? And is there one culture that you feel is expressive right. of a balance? Does it right? Yes. Yeah. I uh, know. I mean, America is a very unusual culture in some respects. Most, the majority of dogs in the world are not owned dogs, for one thing. So when we're talking about dogs, most of us are talking about dogs who are owned, who are in possession of people, and in some cases, maybe sort of in a community, live in a community, potentially in a real, a real estate venture, which allows dogs, you could have a community of dogs, right, who kind of know each other. But um, most dogs in the world are free-ranging and they, live, they kind of uh, live around humans. And so what we're talking about is, is, is highly unusual and how, as has been alluded a couple of times, how different cultures think about dogs is enormously different. What we're saying is just this minority. Many cultures don't 
view dogs as um, dirty or um, predatory on their space or resources, um, and certainly not family members the way I think of my dogs. Um, so I think we're talking about a very small view, but a, a powerful view that's influential and that um, mm -hmm. has a lot of money behind it, right? So dominates the conversation. Do you have questions for each other before I unleash the audience? <laughs> You can think about it. So in the me uh, you said, oh. So let's start. Who has the first question over here? Oh, wait. Uh, I, I love the question of like, what Hold on, the mic is coming. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love the question of, uh, you asked earlier about what's the ideal future world of this. And uh, I wanted to open that up. To the rest of the panel. Oh, uh, should I, should can I repeat, repeat it, yeah. sorry. I love the question earlier of what does the ideal future world look like with human dog coexistence? And I wanted to open that up to the rest and of the And cats thing. and lizards and geckos Stop. and elephants. <laughs> so ah, who can answer this? Jack. Well, um, I think that this ideal world question is just a, it's just a misguided question, uh, really, because the things that would have to change in order um, for us to resolve this relationship to the animal is everything, like everything would have to change because it's, it's true, you can't just open up the door and let the dogs go, right? Be a lot of the problems in the relationships between humans and non-human animals are about habitat encroachment, uh, about environmental decline, about the immense burden that humans place upon the environments and particularly environments of other creatures. So it's not like, can we get the relation between the human and the dog right? It's like, can we rethink who we are as humans in order to fix a much bigger structure? And that's why my, my presentation is pointedly about the human and not the dog. I'm going to go there and then to you, Tom. Um, the, yeah, short hair and, and glasses. I, yeah, thank you. I cannot see you. <laughs> Hi, well, thank you for saying that because I've been sitting here thinking about how um, nobody has really talked yet about what dogs can teach us about exactly that and the ideal per an ideal perfect state of human dog relations might have something to do with what dogs or other animals cats etc can teach us if we are willing to pay attention to the natural world such as we're able to experience it with our animals i'm just saying this as a again, relatively recent dog owner after not having one for 20 years. And 20 years ago, I changed my life so that I could be in a, in, in a professional and personal way more, respective, more respectful and learning about nature. And now, and now I find you, myself doing it again. Answer yeah. Oh, it's not a question. question. Yeah, sorry, it's not oh, a question, okay. I All guess. Right. I, well, how much have so any of you thought have, about that? Uh, so sorry. do we have one here? Can I steal from you? Okay, <laughs> easier. Thank you. So I have a question about domestication, which is, um, and I'm not an expert in this field at all, but I mean, we're a, we're a species that's self-domesticated. Is that, do we agree with that? Are we a domesticated animal? We are, mm -hmm. right? And we had domesticated ourselves. So I'm just thinking about dog domestication, which is at some level a cruel project of domination. But it's also, domestication isn't necessarily a bad thing. We have to go down the road of domesticating ourselves if there's any hope for the planet, I think. So I just wonder if there's, if there's any comment on that. Do we believe? Who wants to take that? Is domestication itself a bad thing? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that's our I only hope? I think Will wants to answer. Uh, I don't know if I can respond directly to the question. Um, but I am also interested in what Young might have to say about questions of development. I did a lot of research around Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses and how the landscape of New York City changed and was optimized for cars. And I think the, one of the ways in which dogs might be able to teach us how to be together is if they had more space. When I think of dogs, I think about like the kind of space that they need to take up and actually expand their behaviors. I think about questions of territory and common ground. And I think New York is, we like lost that battle a long time ago. And I'm curious about like the ways in which common ground can be produced and reproduced or blended and, and, and um, I don't know. And, 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 and dogs also, I mean, well-trained dogs let out to kind of uh, approach 
other people and the kind of bridge divides. I think Jane Jacobs, you know, kind of whole philosophy was about like a mixed use neighborhood as well as, you know, people on the street watching out for their neighbors and I mean, animal, you know, dogs who are shepherds and have that kind of tendency to also herd and, and, and collect and, and, you know, pacify and, and, and bind people and their, their charges together. I'm curious about, yeah, city space and development in that, like outdoor space. With the fear of seeming very naive and optimist, um, you know, I am the entrepreneur who makes, try to design experiences that make dogs and people kind of like happy, but at a very basic level, not at this, I would say like slightly abstract and kind of like very macro level that we're debating right now. I think there's a lot of things we can learn for dogs, right? Like here are these amazing creatures that we learned in many ways, with many negative components, but also very positive to live together. You know, they make us happy, um, you know, we know that from, they make us less stressed, they make us less depressed, they make us all these different things, right? And I don't know how to talk for animals, and, and you know, that's why I think the work that Dr. Howitz is doing is so important, because she is really trying to make us understand better what, what they think. But, you know, it is a species that seem to be, if you compare it to other species, seem to be living a decent life, right? You know, like it's a little bit compared to what? Uh, you know, they live longer, uh, you know, they live in beautiful Chelsea apartments with their own bathtub. Um, and, and I so I think compared to other speeches, you know, like they seem to be doing okay. And so I don't want to dismiss the kind of like the macro conversation that is going on, but I do think of what can we learn from them. I think there's a lot of things we can learn from them, and I think there's a lot of stuff that we as human do learn from them. You know, we think the dogs think a certain way of us, I'm sure they probably don't, but we think, and many times we would like to be the dogs that, you know, the, the, sorry, the, the people that our dogs think we are. And so I think, you know, we are constantly learning, you know, in, in this kind of like symbiotic relationship. And so I do think while there's negative things, there is a lot of positive things that is happening from this relationship too. You know, uh, oh no, sorry, Young. Mm -hmm. The best thing about dog, they don't talk. <laughs> and they don't get upset. They don't fight back to you. Yet. I think that, <laughs> that is a you know, really powerful thing to me. You don't have to say to deliver your message. You can read their eyes, their body, and how they behave. I think we all humans should learn from them. I, mm -hmm. I think to me, it, this society needs good friends. There is nobody better than dog to be friends. And of course, they are not perfect, and we are not perfect either. And I wish, you know, I wish, you know, we, we, we think dog like our true family member. It's not like dog, yet because of dog, they gotta be treated differently. Jack? Can I just point out that one of the reasons that humans decided to domesticate dogs specifically is because they're docile and easily trained, not that intelligent, as it turns out, Alexandra might disagree with me. Uh, but there, you know, the, this desire for mastery uh, is just so clear, actually, uh, in this comment that they, they don't speak, they don't respond, they don't Susan. resist, and this is why we love them. And I also think it's interesting to have the narrative about what a good life the animal has from the entrepreneur. I mean, the, I is this a narrative about love or is it about money? And do we know the difference? I'm just saying, I'm just being a little provocative, right? Because it's that's what the salon is for, right? Fine, um, absolutely. Right. Susan, your third. Marco first, and then Carol, and then Susan. I need a mic. Oh, oh. Marco. Yeah. Marco. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, the, the word for female dogs, both in English and Spanish, it's a pejorative term. Uh, we've, it apparently has been used to, 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 how can we, is there a way to reclaim the word uh, for female dogs? And obviously we have a very strange relationship treating male dogs, uh, female dogs, or even calling dogs it in English. Uh, mm. Is there some way that... Uh, Do you want to take this? Mm -hmm. Yes, I just want to see if we, I don't want to say the word, but uh, I also like how do I do it, mm -hmm. if you could help. But I feel, I feel like, as we just said, dogs don't talk, and we spend a lot of time talking on their behalf and talking for them. And I think that in that way they have the upper hand because they don't have to uh, work with words and hide behind words, and 
they have more time to observe us, to listen to us and to know us. So it's not so much about what can we learn from dogs, but what do they know about us? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Carol, over here. I'm so interested um, that other than the last scene of Jack's film, which is more terrifying, there has really been, no one's been talking about wildness. Like we're talking about domestication. Has that made us happy as humans, really? And where is the wildness that, that maybe we can learn something from, from animals and from dogs that maybe we inhibit in ourselves so totally and have killed in the society so much? So I just throw that out. <laughs> Can I say something yeah, about please. that? So I think what's kind of interesting about dogs, uh, since I didn't think I was going to be studying dogs, I didn't set out to study dogs, I was just interested in non-humans. I mean humans too, but non-humans. Mm. And then dogs turned out to be an interesting species for studying what I was studying. But now looking at it, I think that um, they are um, really good ambassadors for us to think about up, you know, those other than ourselves. And it is because they are other than us that I think we especially appreciate having them um, in our houses. And my project, I sort of see, if I looked at kind of what, how my thinking has gone over many years, is that first I very much wanted to say, you know, the types of anthropomorphisms we made of dogs were wrong, we're kind of, we're kind of pretending they're little people and they're really not, and instead they're these smelling creatures who, in a world we don't know anything about. What I think I was doing was taking advantage of the fact that they're this familiar animal we already love, and, and once we're already there, and our hearts are like on the edge, we want to know all the things, and saying like, guess what? That dog is actually completely different. So I think there is a wildness in them, and they can kind of be a model. Our way, this conversation, our way of thinking about dogs is the kind of ideal future for dogs and other animals, insofar as we got them close enough to us, we're, we're in it, we're ready. Except for Jack, we want them to be here with us. <laughs> but get, but once we're in that posture, I can kind of slip the rug out and say, like, but you know what? They're actually not like us. They're this other animal. And by the way, like, let's do that with some of the other animals. Kind of get us to see who they, you know, feel something for them, res see the resemblance to us, and then be reminded that they're really not like us. So I feel like that wildness is in them, and it actually serves as an, an interesting role in my mind in thinking about other animals as well. Susan, blonde lady with glasses that's kind of like, yeah, <laughs> thriving for the mic. Yeah. Great. Thank you all. It's really stimulating. Um, quest, the qu I have a question and an observation, or actually two questions. The first is, not is it, one. it's oh, only one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is it not true that dogs were socialized by eating our scraps in ancient times? That they came to be with us by the virtue of the fact that it became easier to eat when humans left leftovers. So they did it, not us. Right. Well, <laughs> I mean, it, we set up the condition, but is that, I mean, I watch a lot of uh, David Attenborough, and I <laughs> mean, I don't, I'm asking you guys to verify if that's true. And then lastly, can we switch from domestication to socialization? Can I, I'll speak to the sure. domestication thing. I'm just going to try my best David Attenborough voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, we don't know how domestication happened of dogs, but one theory, and the one you allude to, was suggested by uh, uh, Ray Coppinger, was that there was a time when humans became less nomadic, and then we developed uh, this new thing, which was trash, right? Because we're in villages, and we're eating, and then we're throwing things out. And instead of just walking away, the way we do in New York when we drop our trash. You know, we had piles of it, and there were some enterprising wolves who um, maybe were less fearful of people, is, the, is, is the, how the story goes, and I think this is a reasonable possibility, and also saw this new ecological niche, which was f food, right? Like, we weren't eating a lot of the food that we were throwing out, the things we can't digest and, or chew, and so got closer to people, and then oh, sort of over generations, self-domesticated, essentially, in so, uh, to a sufficient degree that they could interact with us. And then at some point, there might have been taking a wolf cub and nursing the cub or eating wolves, right? And so that we got closer and closer as societies. 
and, t and that was well before probably there was any specific breeding by people of dogs. So that is a story that hasn't yeah. quite been overthrown, but w will never be t completely verified because we can't go back there. Benedicta, something. Uh, yeah, yeah mm. it's not, we talked about the ideal relationship between dogs and human beings there. There is no ideal relationship, but I think what comes closer to the idea of domestication through human habitat is what you can see, for example, in the Caribbean, uh, what we call the quail dog. The quail, quail dog? dog? The quail dog. So the quail dog is not a pet, it's not, uh, domesticated in the Western way, but it lives, it roams free, and it gets food where it can. But it doesn't give anything in return, there is no companionship, there is nothing, it's just, it's just around. So it recreates the idea of domestication without having this, uh, this time. So that's proximity, it's living yeah, together, but not, uh, yes. uh -huh. or it's around human habitat for trash and mm -hmm. leftovers or whatever they can get. Henrik, did you want to say something about the uh, domestication versus socializ socialization? Nope. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who's next? Who's there? Over there, um, second row from the back, and then I'll come to you. Thank you. Um, I found myself maybe building on the question about wildness, thinking about the comments about dog sex. Um, and on the one hand, um, Alexandra has said to us, we're uncomfortable with dog sex. And Jack has said to us, in fact, we've made laws against dogs and people having sex. But that analogy about sodomy made me think, well, I'm glad that those laws that prevented two men from having sex have been t overturned. So are we supposed to be excited for people to have sex with dogs? And should we be more comfortable with dogs having sex with each other? Is that the sexual liberation Alexander and Jack are imagining? Um, I mean, the f one thing to say about wildness, by the way, is that it's a colonial trope. And it's a colonial trope for everything that falls outside of the purview of civilization, and therefore demands con conquest. Um, and so w we should be like a little bit worried about the category of wildness, but also recognize that the wild, what now constitutes the wild is everything beyond human control. I'm not saying, oh, we should have sex with animals, but I, I can tell you that we already do. And what that's called is food production, okay? There are, there are all kinds of animal husbandry practices on, uh, animal, uh, on dairy farms around the country where a farmer sticks his hand into a cow's uterus and delivers sperm or holds a horse while the horse is having sex, w uh, the stud having sex with the mare and so on. Um, and in fact, when the sodomy <coughs> laws were banned, this created a problem for the meat industry because it sounded like some of the activities that the meat industry is engaged in had suddenly become illegal. So Gabriel Rosenberg, uh, a researcher at Duke University, has written a really amazing paper on exactly this topic to show how it is that the repeal of sodomy laws was then contested by the meat industry so that they could not be charged with because the, the, they separated out bestiality from same-sex desire, repealed sodomy laws, and then made new bestiality laws that would have put many people in the meat industry under question as to whether what they were doing was legal. So what I'm saying is we're okay with a guy sticking his hand into a cow's uterus or, or uh, injecting sperm uh, into an animal, uh, but we're not okay with uh, somebody actually having sex with the animal uh, in a way that supposedly is consensual or whatever, because we don't believe that the animal can consent. But the animal doesn't consent to any of that meat production stuff either. So my point is basically that there's a reimposition of a natural order of things again that keeps certain things separate and maintains our fantasy that our relationship with our animal is pure and untainted either by any kind of perverse sexuality on the one hand and is completely separate from the meat industry on the other. Those are complete fantasies. There's a scene in my dog performance where I actually simulate sex with the dog too. And it was kind of, I mean, I think in part because I was interested in like this sort of nebulous space of like kind of domestic, kind of a playground, kind of a, is this a forest of dogs? I mean, I kind of keep reshaping how they are an environment or a partner or like a protagonist or a projectile. And at some point, 
I lay down and I'm kind of wrestling with it and just kind of and stay in that position for a long time trying to kind of push this question of the erotics of at least the image to kind of invite the audience to imagine that again kind of raising questions around you know how my body gets conflated with questions around animality or um, but also to think about the pleasure of this, to think about the, the awkwardness of what that might be, and, and to, just to start to kind of tiptoe into what I think gets so often kind of like thrown out um, uh, for questions of sort of standardized morality or, um, yeah. We have one last question here. Hi, thank you. This was uh, absolutely amazing, and I think uh, I learned so much from this conversation. And I'm wondering when I go home and I choose not to hug my dog after seven years, he's going to think something's really wrong with me or he's done something uh, or bad. Or maybe he's going to think, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the fact that uh, you, know, you guys take the time to write books about uh, you know, these relationships and dance with dogs and uh, all of this stuff. And Yong, I know that uh, a lot of people snickered when you said that you wanted to start a dog condominium. And uh, you know, I know that you were one of the first people to bring the car elevator to the North America, which was amazing. You put your car in and you go up to your apartment with your car. You uh, had the vision to take an abandoned pier and make it Google's you know, uh, headquarters here in uh, New York. And uh, I want to know, is this condominium going to be dog first condominium or is it sort of an expanded amenity to the condominium that already exists? Yeah, there are many dog friendly uh, apartments in New York City, but we're trying to elevate that into, you know, we think like dog, see what dog really wants, and see if we can provide more than usual thing. And uh, which we are studying to achieve that. And we still have to do a lot of research. Actually, he and I go back two years and we were talking about this. But it's a fascinating and it's, it's a very interesting uh, subject to me and how we can live together happily. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have um, a theory that I want to share with you because after all, it's my salon. <laughs> so I think that there are cities of cats like uh, Milan, my city, or Paris, you know, like people are like cats. Then there are cities of dogs, and New York is a city of dogs. We're all dogs, if we're all curious about each other. If we could, we would sniff each other's butt when we meet, right? <laughs> so I feel that uh, maybe we are one step closer to really understanding how we can live together um, because we have that experience. Otherness is something that we encounter every day in New York City. Milan was not used to it, it's starting to be used to it now, but I feel that using dogs in our mind as a metaphor for otherness is extremely important. It could be the first exercise because they're so much part of our life toward finding a better understanding of life itself. So that said, well, that declared, I want to really thank the Anosia Raferas and Samantha Ozer who put together tonight's program. I want to thank you these amazing speakers and as usual, as you know very well, there's mediocre wine and so-so snacks outside. We can, we can hang on for another hour, hour and a half. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>